Good morning. It's good to have you with us again today. Thank you for joining with us. Just want to say if you're living here and you're close and you've not been to the church, you're welcome to come. We'd love to have you join us as well. Plus, we're meeting on Wednesdays every Wednesday night, 630 to 8. We're outside and we're just having a great time of fellowship with our community and reaching out. And we'd love to have you come too. We are in the book of Revelation. We're in chapter 14 and 15 today. <clears throat> We encounter the holiness of God today. This is really kind of front and center in this passage. We're moving towards the end of the tribulation. We're reminded as we look here at the book of Revelation that the tribulation is true, folks. It's going to happen. Jesus Christ is going to come again. When he comes, he's going to take, he's going to take the church. He's going to take every genuine believer who's in the world right now. He's going to take those believers home to be with him. He's going to remove the Holy Spirit, his power of restraining evil, and evil is going to have its way. And for seven years, God will judge this earth. For seven years, God will judge Israel and then restore her again to a place of blessing. God's going to take down the kingdom of, of, of Satan, the domain of Satan. And God is going to do his work. We are moving now towards the very end of the tribulation here in Revelation. We're seeing God on the precipices of bringing the final judgments. And so we encounter the holiness of God. When we think of the holiness of God, we often think of, I know you can't read it all, but we often think of that hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy. And we sing it, and it's, it's one of my favorite hymns. It's an awesome hymn. It's majestic. And it, and it, and it helps us to just uh, verbalize and lift up that one, that one attribute of God that's, that's repeated three times. It's the holiness of God. It's not grace, 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 or mercy, 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 or love, love, love. It's the holy, holy, holiness of God. That's what we see in Scripture. And we worship him, and he's God, God Almighty, and his holy is exalted, and his, holy, his holiness separates him from us. Because of sin, we are separated in our very nature because of a holy God. And now we see the, the full ramifications and meaning of that holiness, and I want us to see that this morning. So I want us to, I want us to see the, the implications of the holiness of God in Revelation and in this passage specifically. So if you have your Bible, turn to Revelation chapter 14. We're going to pick it up at verse 14 and we're going to start moving forward. The first thing that we see is from that first verse that we pick up in verse 14. John writes, And then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and seated on the cloud, one like a son of man, with a golden crown on his head, and a sharp sickle in his hand. What we see here in this passage is a holy one. We see one like a son of man. We see the son of man, that attribute, uh, attributed to Jesus Christ over and over again in the Gospels. It reveals his humanity. He is 100% man and yet without sin. He is also the son of God, 100% God, holy, eternal, sovereign in every way. And, and, those, and, and, and those two elements are brought together in the person of Jesus Christ. He is the Son of Man, and we're going to talk about that, that term here in just a second. In, in Daniel chapter 7, we see, uh, we see this element of the Son of Man in, in chapter 7. I saw in the night visions, behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a Son of Man. We believe this is a direct reference to the coming Jesus Christ. And he came to the Ancient of Days, that's the Heavenly Father, and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. These are words right out of Revelation. John picks, picks this prophecy up and sees its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And, um, and so, so we have this terminology, this reference of Son of Man being attributed to Christ here in the Old Testament, looking ahead. And we see, I believe, Jesus Christ here as well in chapter 14, verse 14, as the Son of Man. We see in chapter 1, when the revelation of, of John here in this book starts, verses 13 and 14, in the midst of the church, the lamp stands, one like a Son of Man, that's Jesus Christ, clothed with a long robe, with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were, were white, were light, white wool like snow. And so we see descriptors of Jesus Christ that are identical to what we see here in this verse as well. We see him on a, on a cloud, a, a white cloud. This is a preview of what's about to just take place here momentarily. The, the judgment, the bold judgments are going to be poured out. And Jesus Christ is going to return in the clouds as he's promised. And, and John is seeing that preview 
Um, this whiteness here in, in Revelation is, is a, re a reference not to Jesus being an old man, but to, but to his, his wisdom, his, his eternality, his purity, all those things that we see as well. In Luke chapter 5, we see uh, this also attributed to Jesus Christ. Jesus says that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He told the paralytic, take up your bed and walk. The one who, one who is able to, to forgive sins is one who is holy. And Jesus Christ takes on and embodies that attribute as well because he is indeed God himself. We see in Mark chapter 16, Jesus Christ coming in power. Jesus says, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with what? The clouds of heaven. That's what we see right here. This verse isn't the second coming in, in Revelation 14. Not yet, but it is a preview. It is, it is Jesus Christ at the ready for that moment to take place. The second coming that we're going to see on just a few chapters coming. Now the question is, some would say that uh, this Son of Man in, chapter four, in verse 14 is, is an angel. Verse 15 says, And another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the, in the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap. And we see an angel give, give a, a command to this person in verse 14, and, and some would come to the conclusion, uh, Jesus would never be commanded by someone else. But what we see in verse 15 is not, is not the command of one who is an authority over, over Jesus. We see, we see a proclamation one who is given the honor of giving the proclamation that the time is now ready. And the angel, the angel announces that time, and then Jesus then uh, fulfills that proclamation as the only one who can. So I see no discontinuity, no contradiction, no inability for the Son of Man here in verse 14 to be indeed Jesus Christ. In fact, the term Son of Man is never attributed to an angel. And so I have uh, full confidence, as I look at the text, the context of Revelation in Scripture, that that the Son of Man here is indeed Jesus Christ, and He is He is at the ready. Uh, the second coming is coming, but not yet quite here. And so we have the holiness of the Son of Man, of Jesus Christ, who He is, in His very nature. We've seen all 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 the way through Revelation His holiness. Now He is at the ready. We see also in verse 15 as we pick it up, and let's pick it up here and read through chapter 15, verse 1. And so in verse 15, another angel came out of the temple, uh, calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, an angel whose authority over, who has authority over the fire. And he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, Put in your sickle, and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. And so the angel swung his sickle across the earth, and gathered the grape harvest of the earth, and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and the blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle from 1600 stadia. And then I saw another angel, another, I'm sorry, another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last. For with them the wrath of God is finished. You also notice here as we, as we look at... Uh, the previous chapter, in, in, in verse 14, verse 8, we see another angel. In verse 9 of chapter 14, we see another angel. Again, here in verse 15, we see another angel. In verse 17, another angel. In verse 18, another angel. We see that pattern is God's angels are coming, 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 fulfilling. What breaks that pattern is, for, is verse 14, one like the Son of Man. Another clue that this is not an angel. This is indeed Jesus Christ. So now what we see in the verses that we're about to, uh, uh, to look at now is, again, the holiness of God, and we see the holy judgment of God. The phrase that, that comes to the top here is, put in your sickle. I've got a couple pictures here. Maybe you know what a sickle is. Maybe you've used it from days gone by. Maybe you have no idea. This is kind of the instrument right here, and it's, 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 that, round, it's that round tool that was used for harvest sharp. And uh, in the scriptures, when we see that, it's always meant... Uh, regarding judgment or, or harvest time by the parable of the wheats and the tares where, where God's going to ultimately here at the end of this time 
He's going to separate those who are believer and unbeliever. He's going to bring the harvest of believers together, the harvest of unbelievers together, separate those. Ultimately, at the great white throne, we're going to have the sheep and the goats, that, that, that eternal harvest. It, is, it always is meant to the harvest of souls. And, and so the phrase that, that rises here is, is put in your sickle. We have indeed here descriptions of now the judgment of God that has happened. See, the seventh trumpet has blasted. And the result of that seventh trumpet will be these seven bowls that unfold. In the meantime, God has said, okay, let me explain a few things before those bowls actually are poured out. Jesus has explained those things now through John. He is now setting the final stage, and then, and then those seven bowl judgments are going to be poured out. All the judgments that have gone previous, the seals and the trumpets, have been uh, proportional to a, to a portion of the earth. These last seven bowl judgments will affect the whole earth. His judgment will be across the whole world in every way. We see the judgment of God here, the seven bowls. The, the question is, some see in verse 15 and 16, and then in verse uh, 17 through 20, two separate judgments. Some might see a judge, uh, the harvest of believers separated in verses 15 and 16. Some might see the harvest of unbelievers in, in verses 17 to 20. But it seems to me that the context of the passage here is judgment. It is all about judgment. It is the coming judgment that has been explained and is now is now about to happen, we see here in, in chapter uh, 16. And so the context surrounding this is judgment, not reward. It's not the harvest of believers. I believe both of these are referring to judgment. Um, and so we have, we have a distinction here. Jesus Christ at the cross, he says, it is finished. When he did that, when he conveyed, he conveyed grace. He conveyed grace to you and to me. He says to the world at the cross, come unto me, all you who labor, and I will give you rest. He says to all of us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He says to all of us, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the grace of the cross. It is finished. I have finished the work. Now it is available, it is accessible to man by faith to receive and to enter into and step into a relationship with, with God the Father through Christ. And I trust that you've done that this morning. And then we see Jesus Christ as judge. We see the wrath of God. At the end of the tribulation right here, he says it is done. It, the judgment of God is done. It is, it is now completed. With this proclamation, now that final judgment is going to be poured out. And there will be no escape. See, grace has ended here. Up to this point, even, even in the passage just previous, we saw, we saw Jesus Christ use an angelic proclamation of the gospel worldwide. The world is given given opportunity for grace to the very end. I don't ever want you to forget that. That God is a God of grace. But when that grace comes to an end, when I breathe my last breath, there is no other all, a moment and opportunity for grace. Grace is ending here, and now judgment is coming upon the world. When John the Baptist introduced the ministry of Jesus Christ, this is how this is one of the ways in which he described it. Jesus, his winnowing fork is in his hand. That's that harvesting fork. He will clear his threshing floor. He'll gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. We see the separation of believer and unbeliever. It's a harvest picture here that is, that is seen. It's the wheats and the tares. And the disciple says, but we can't tell the difference. Jesus says, I know the difference. I know everyone who is believer. I know everyone who is unbeliever. There's no ambiguity in my ability to discern and to know and to understand the heart of man. And I will separate the two. And that's exactly what is John is proclaiming here at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus and what's being communicated here at the end of the ministry of Jesus. Prophetically, we see this, this judgment come. Isaiah 63 is very, very clear on this, the whole passage. Why is your apparel red, speaking of Jesus ultimately, and your garments like his who treads in the winepress? I've trodden the winepress alone. I trod them in my anger. I trampled them in my wrath. Their lifeblood splattered on my garments and stained all of my apparel. For the day of vengeance was in my heart. And my year of redemption had come. I looked and there was no one to help. And I was appalled and there was no one to uphold. So my right arm brought me salvation. Do you see the picture here? Judgment, wrath, and grace. And grace has come, but now wrath is the end result for those who have refused and rejected. And my wrath upheld me. I trampled down the peoples in my anger, and I made them drunk in my wrath. 
and had poured out their lifeblood on the earth. And that's just a, a, a vivid description of the judgment that now will unfold here from chapter 14 into 15 into 16 and come. Joel chapter 3, we see this. Hasten and come, all of you surrounding nations, and gather yourself. He, Jesus is going to call all the, the armies of the world together. They're going to gather against Israel. Bring down your warriors, O Lord. Let the nations stir themselves up and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Go in, tread, for the wine press is full. Their vats overflow, for their evil is great. That picture of the wine press is just the is the stopping of grapes and that juice just pouring out. And, and uh, you know, we think of that. We think of the of the Lucy episode where it's funny and it's laughing. And but that's this isn't the scene here. The scene here is one of devastation. The scene here is one of utter judgment. And God is treading this world, and the unbelievers are being are being trampled under by the judgment of God. Prophecy even against Israel and for Israel and Zephaniah. Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided in your midst. I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken and the houses plundered and the woman raped. Half of the city shall go out into exile, but the rest of the people shall not, not be cut off from the city. God's going to allow Jerusalem to be, to be overrun, overwhelmed, but he's still going to protect Israel. And then, 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 the Lord, the Lord will go out and fight against those nations. And when he fight, as when he fights on the day of battle, and on that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives. That's when he returns, the second coming of the Lord. We could read more. But Jesus Christ is going to fight. He's going to preserve a remnant of Israel. He's going to protect them and bring them into the millennial kingdom. They will survive. There will be a remnant that will survive the judgment of God that's about to be poured out here. It's the grace of God to Israel, fulfilling his promises to Israel that he has always kept and intended to keep. Israel, folks, is here in Revelation. They are a nation specific and chosen by God. God has not set them aside by the wayside. He will bring them back as a nation and bless them. That is completely of God. Here in the end of Revelation chapter 19. And from the mouth of the Lord comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nation, simply with his word. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. Here we have the wheats and the tares, Matthew chapter 13. Let, us, let, let both grow together, Jesus says to the disciples, until the harvest. At the harvest time, I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned. Unbelievers. But gather the wheat into my barn. The unbelievers here at the end of the tribulation will be judged first. And then those who have survived and lived will be brought into the kingdom of God, the millennial kingdom with the church and the martyrs who have already gone before them. And we see the separation of unbeliever and believer taking place. Here we have the final judgment that's going to take place. Not the final, final judgment. That's the great white throne. We're going to encounter that. But the final judgment here at the end of the tribulation. When, when the rapture occurs, every believer right now, every believer in this world will be lifted up out of this earth and we will be taken home to be with Jesus Christ. There will be no believers on the earth after the rapture. But then believers will be saved through the tribulation. All through the tribulation there will be a revival. And, and the multitudes from every language and people and tongue will be saved. And then they will be martyred and slaughtered. At the end of the tribulation, God will judge the earth. At the end of the tribulation, there will be no unbelievers in this world. God will have removed every unbeliever from this world through death. And the believers who have survived will move into the millennial kingdom to unite with the church and those who have been martyred for Jesus Christ, and we will step together into the millennial kingdom. That's the picture that we're seeing here. I want to give you that picture. Again, we have the holiness of God. His judging holiness. He judges because He's holy. He judges sin because He's holy. Verses Chapter 15, verses 2, 3, and 4. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire. We've seen this before, before the altar of God. 
and also those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. These are the martyrs who have given their lives for Jesus Christ. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God and the song of the lamb saying, great and amazing are your deeds. O Lord God, the almighty, just and true are your ways. O King of the nations, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come, all nations, all nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Here we have worship, we have holy worship. God, Jesus Christ, for you alone are worthy. The response of those in heaven to this final judgment of God is worship is he is the only one, remember in Revelation 4 and 5, he is the only one who is worthy to unleash the terror of God's pure wrath against sin. And when that wrath is poured out, it is a signal to every believer who has ever lived that God's promises are now being fulfilled, that the kingdom of God is on the precipice of being brought into, into real existence, that unbelievers will be taken from this world, that sin will be judged. And it results in, in worship before God. Because God is fulfilling His word and carrying out His promises. We see the song of we see the song of Moses mentioned here. They sing the song of Moses. You know, we, we go to our churches and we think, oh, I don't like those hymns, they're old. Folks, this is the song of Moses. This goes back thousands of years. What is the song of Moses? There's only two songs that Moses recorded in, in the Old Testament. One doesn't apply, it doesn't fit the context, but the other one does. Exodus chapter 15, just a portion of it. After they pass the Red Sea and God provides a miracle, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. God brought victory over Pharaoh and his armies. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will praise him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. That song, I believe, is still going to be sung through the generations. And I believe that's the song that's being sung right here. The song of Moses, even in heaven. It's pretty exciting. You know, it's amazing that, that there is music that is, that is being written by, by humans, prompted by God, that may well be sung in heaven. Maybe the Hallelujah Chorus is going to be sung in heaven. It's very possible. And then we're going to be learning new songs continually of praise to Christ. This is an old song. It is a current song. It is still a new song. And we have a song of the Lamb. You know, there's a lot of, lot of thoughts on what the song of the Lamb is. There's not really a specified song of the Lamb in the Scripture. But, but uh, as I was reading, one author says, you know what? Here's, here's, here's that potential, and I believe he's right. It's right here in Revelation. It's chapter 5. And they sang what? A new song. Saying, worthy are you to take the scroll. And it's referring to Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is, ex is exalted, magnified, exemplified, lifted up because he is worthy by his work on the cross to take the scroll and to carry out everything, to fulfill everything that we see taking place here. A new serum. That is great. We see a Savior who is holy here. This is, the theme is, is, the focus is the holiness of God. It was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest. That's Jesus Christ. He is holy. He is innocent. He is unstained. He is separated from sinners. He is exalted above the heavens. And, you know, the Lord calls all believers to that testimony, that we would be holy, that we would be innocent in our walk before others. We would be unstained from this world, be separated from sinners. Not separated in the sense that we don't have any contact with them, but separated in our testimony, separated in purity, separated in, in our values, committed to Jesus Christ. Revelation 16, a holy judge. I heard an angel say about Christ, just are you, just are you, a holy, O holy one, who is and who was, for you brought these judgments. The only one who could possibly bring judgment against sin, again, is, is a holy God. That's Jesus Christ. Verse 5 and 6, we continue. We continue to see the holiness of Jesus Christ as he acts as judge against the sin of this world and sinners who have rejected him in unbelief. And after this, verse 5, I looked, and the sanctuary of the tent or tabernacle of, of witness in heaven was open. We've been there. It's the very presence of God. It's the, te it's the, it's the uh, temple of God. It's in the, before the throne room of God. And out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues, 
clothed in pure, bright linen with gold sashes around their chests. We see the angels of of Christ, these seven angels come out. They're, they're, they're adorned with this fine linen, this pure, bright linen. It again represents the, uh, the holiness that has been given to them. It re represents the purity with which they serve the Lord. You know, whenever the Lord, whenever we serve the Lord, He calls us to serve Him in holiness. We're to be holy as He is holy. He says to you and I as believers, when we offer service to Him, when we serve others, we serve our family, we serve someone in our neighborhood, we serve someone at work, we serve at the church, when we give our abilities and our talents before the Lord, we use what God's given to us in service, we're to serve with motivations that are pure. We're to serve with holiness in our life. We're not to bring dirty, tainted service before the Lord that's corrupted by willful, defiant sin or sin patterns in my life. We're to be right with God as we serve God. He calls us to that. Just as the angels here serve the Lord in holiness, we are called to do that as well. The church, after all, is described this way in chapter 19. It was granted to the church. That's the context here. To clothe herself. See, the church is in view again here in chapter 19. With fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous, the holy deeds of the saints. Again, we're not saved by those righteous deeds. We're not saved by works. But those things are the very things that affirm our genuine relationship with Jesus Christ. That we serve with a desire to honor Jesus Christ, to God be the glory in all that we do. Whether we eat, whether we drink, whatever we do, we do it for the glory of God. That's serving God in holiness. When we desire to honor Jesus Christ in what we are doing, in how we are doing it, in the way that we are doing it, we are doing it in holiness. We are doing it before the Lord. God will honor that. When we serve the Lord for ourselves, when we serve the Lord to be seen, when we serve the Lord to be noticed, when we serve the Lord to gain a following, when we serve the Lord selfishly, we serve the Lord with sin in our heart. God does not honor that. He judges that. The church one day will be honored and rewarded. We will be given reward for our service to the Lord that is holy before Him. And so the motivation for your heart and for mine is to say, Lord, help me to have that that. That intent of heart every time, I, every day as I go through the day, that I would do all for the glory of God. It doesn't matter what I do, that I would do it for your glory. And that's what the angels are doing here. All that they do, they do for the glory of God. And then we, and then we finish this holiness. We see the holiness of these angels that are serving before God. And then we see verse 7 and 8. We close with that. And one of the four living creatures, I mean, we saw these four living creatures earlier. They are a unique creation. They're unique from anything else that we see in Scripture. We see them in Ezekiel. We see them here in Revelation. They are described in a way that is unlike anything that is a part of God's creation. They are almost like a instant servants, instant valet to the Lord. Whatever the Lord says, they do it immediately with speed, in obedience, in holiness. It's, it's, it's like they are, they're just unique. And so we have these four living creatures one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels, these seven angels, seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God. The wrath of God is not diluted. It's not watered down. It is the full wrath of God that's going to be poured out. When Jesus Christ died on the cross for you, he took the full wrath of the Heavenly Father for you and I. He died there because you are a sinner. He died there because I am a sinner. He died there because I sin horribly and you sin horribly. He died there because we sin. And no one, no one could take our place but Him. We stood condemned before our Heavenly Father. We had no opportunity to have a relationship with God the Father ever because sin defined and defines everything that we do. Jesus Christ stepped in and made provision for sin and became sin and took the full not the deluded, the full wrath of God against sin. The wrath that's being poured out here was poured against the Son. See, the Jesus Christ took the wrath that he's now pouring out. He endured the very wrath that he's now pouring out. Think about that for a second. Why? Because he loved you and he's a God of grace. And we stand protected against the wrath of God if we stand covered by the blood of Jesus Christ in relationship. We see, we see terror in these verses, holy terror in these verses. It says here, 
in, in verse 8 that no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. And the sanctuary, the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power. And no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. Folks, we, we can't even begin to comprehend the reality of the terror of the wrath of God. We can't comprehend it. No one could stand before the terror of the Lord. Even believers could not stand before the terror of the Lord if it wasn't, if it wasn't for the work of Jesus Christ protecting us for all eternity from this holy terror of God. But we are free from that now because we are in Christ. You've got to remember, you have four living creatures here. You have all of the angels. You have the 24 elders. Who, what, are, what have we seen in Revelation? They're before the throne. They're interacting with God. They are, they are bowing before Him in worship. They're praising Him 24-7, night and day, continually, in the very, very presence of God. Yet when He pours out His wrath against sin, they are not allowed to see it. They are not allowed to be in that inner sanctum, the Holy of Holies. They are taken out of that Holy of Holies. For no one can stand seeing the utter, terrible wrath of God. The earth is receiving the wrath of God. Believer, even the church who is there, cannot be in the very presence of God when that wrath is being poured out. The sanctuary is emptied. The holy sanctum is emptied. The holy of holies is emptied while this wrath is poured out. Do you see that? Do you see, do you see the seriousness of sin? The utter separation of the holiness of God? That's why we need a Savior, folks. That is why we need a Savior. Exodus chapter 40. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting when he met with, with then Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Because the cloud settled on it, the glory of God settled on it, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Paul puts it this way, Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how, be how beautiful that is. How unsearchable are His judgments and how inscrutable His ways. We can't, we cannot, we cannot understand the judgment of God. It's beyond our ability to comprehend. The reality of the awfulness of sin is beyond our ability to, to truly comprehend. Yet He gives us the ability to see how horrible it is so that we might turn from it and receive forgiveness. The reality of hell is, is often simply beyond comprehension. But we trust the justice and the righteousness and the holiness and the, of God. Here's the reality. All have sinned. All of us deserve God's wrath. All have fallen short of this glory of God that we can't see on this level. And heaven, they are seeing the glory of God, but not on this level. It is said in the Scripture, no man can see God the Father face to face and live. This is an element of Reflecting why that is true. In his utter pure holiness, none of us could stand. Even though now I am Jesus Christ. Even those who are in Christ here are still separated from this, from this moment of the wrath of God. It is so terrifying. I want, to, I want to remind you of good news. This is judgment. It's a proclamation of judgment to come. It's terrible. We were told in Isaiah to come to Jesus Christ. That's the protection. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon Him while He's near. Let the wicked forsake His way. In other words, for, forsake our sin. The unrighteous man is thoughts. Return to the Lord. Come to the Lord. Come to the Lord and receive forgiveness. And washing, cleansing, forgiveness, relationship. That's the only hope that you and I have. That mankind has. When we, when we look for opportunities to be intentional and reach people for Jesus Christ and to build relationships and to gain trust of people in that relationship we're looking ultimately for an opportunity to impact them for Jesus Christ, to present to them a Savior they so desperately need because of sin. We are reminded in 1 Peter, once you were a people, you were not a people, but now you are God's people. That's the church, that's us. Once you had not received mercy, folks, we need mercy every day, but now you have received mercy. And here's the most beautiful. This brings the reality of the judgment of God against the reality of the provision of Jesus Christ. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glories of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. 
It's the beauty of it. It's full of grace and truth. When we receive the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are receiving the grace of God. We are receiving God's provision, His protection against sin. We are receiving the opportunity for a relationship, forgiveness of sins. But that's based upon the fact that we have received His truth. There is no salvation without receiving the truth of the message of God. There is no salvation without receiving the truth of Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life without receiving Jesus Christ. Without believing that He is who He claims to be, the very Son of God. God Himself, our Savior. The only provision for sin. The need for man to forsake, for, to forsake our sin and to, and to yield my life to Jesus Christ. To give up my life and say, Lord, my life is yours now. When I receive Jesus Christ as my Savior, I'm saying, Lord, I, I'm willing to follow you. I'm willing to yield to you. That's what relationship is all about. That's the reality of that. That is grace, then that is truth being carried out in my life. And that truth is then carried out in your life and mine by the very grace of God. I want to close with this last verse. John chapter 5, verse 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death into life. John chapter 5, verse 24. That's the reality of Revelation. Those who will be protected to the end of the tribulation are those who have received the truth of Jesus Christ. Received Jesus Christ by faith. Received life and are now protected from the judgment of God. And they've passed from death into life. Now there are those multitudes who are giving their life in the tribulation. Martyrs who are being executed. They're passing into death, but then from death into life. Not to face the second death at the final judgment of Jesus Christ. I trust you have the confidence of relationship with Jesus Christ. I trust you know that assurance. You have that peace. That you can stand before the presence of God because you are in relationship with Jesus Christ. Because you put your faith in Him. I trust that you have the confidence that when you die today, if the Lord comes today, you will be with the Lord because you stand in the holiness of Jesus Christ. You stand full of the presence of God in your life because of what Jesus Christ did for you. And God the Father will look upon you and, and say to you, you are my child. I know you because you're in my son, Jesus Christ. Well done, my good and faithful servant. May the Lord challenge you to walk faithfully for him. Right now, walk faithfully for him. Let people in your life know they need the Lord. Remember, remember, remember. The rapture is going to occur. When that takes place, these events here in Revelation become current events. That means that if the Lord comes today, everyone that we know, everyone that you know who is an unbeliever will step into these set of current events. And they will either reject Jesus Christ and face this judgment, lose their life, or they will receive Jesus Christ and endure the utter hardship of being identified with Christ and most likely be executed for that and then step into to eternity with Christ. This next seven years after the rapture will be a world that's unlike any we've ever faced. Our world is tough now. Our challenges are tough now. There are things happening now we can't even, we can't even hardly explain. It'll, this is nothing compared to what it's going to be like in the tribulation. I trust your testimony is clear and strong. I trust that you have a passion for people who need the Lord and you're willing to talk about Jesus Christ. I trust that you are confident in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining with us. We're glad to have you here all the time. God's Word is powerful. May it change your life by faith. Lord, change me. Again, thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.